the most amazing project was the Defender project because that was we were the number two pinball company at the time and we were we were yeah we're going to get in the video game business yeah right Williams and we got a bunch of people they were put in a separate facility um, over on Belden Avenue and this group you know everybody had one goal and that was in a pretty short time frame to do whatever it took to make a to make a really hot video game and and the just the way things were accomplished by that group and the atmosphere among this group uh, was just amazing I've never seen it equaled and you know now I'm, I've got a management role and I would love to take and bottle whatever the ingredients were um, to try and create a situation like that again and, and it was just it's the best situation I've ever seen or been in Management came down. This was about three months before the show, before we had to finish this game. And management came down and goes, "Man, this game is a pile of. I mean, this game is is so stupid. I mean, what are these people on here? I mean, where are you going? You know? It was like, you know, they were they were saying, okay, you got to get rid of these stupid astronauts out of there. You know, get some game going here. You know, because you are really blowing it." pretty crazy because the night this this was insane actually the um, at the time we for our development system we used this thing called a Motorola Exerciser which was this huge the, probably the most bloated overpriced computer ever created it was a dual floppy disk system they used eight inch floppy disks which were like you know enormous held like you know ten bytes on them and you had um, this twenty thousand dollar box that I mean, would only work for like three or four days at a time before it fa something failed. You know, it was, it, was, it was horrendous. So it got to the point late in the project where it was taking like half an hour to just assemble the program, and so it just it was and the and the and the odds of actually getting an assembly that actually made it were were so low that the last week of the of the project we just they essentially just just object code patches. We left the computer on. The program was in memory. Thank goodness it never was a power failure. And we just made patches in the code and just kind of stuffed them in there for the different bugs. Um, and then it was like 4 a.m. and it was like, okay, we gotta burn the ROMs for the show. And we like burned them, we like took all the, all, everything was stuck in this computer memory. So we had to like pull out the, the bytes essentially and then burn them into EEPROMs. And we did it, and like it was at 6 a.m., plugged them in, it didn't work. And I was like, oh. And I was, <laughs> I was like, what happened? You know, did we bend a pin? Did we, you know, of these, you know, 12 ROMs, you know, what was screwed up? And I, we burned them again or something, and they were like all blank or something. I don't know what it was. But finally we burned them again, and we got the damn thing working. And we like took these chips to the show. The cabinets were sitting on the show floor, like awaiting this program. You know, so we got to the show at like 7 a.m. and you know plugged into chips, and the thing came on, and it was just like we were just go, oh my god, it worked. You know, we just we were just you know couldn't believe it. It was like we were just so high from like not sleeping, and you know it was just just this ultimate high to like just this thing actually worked. The show it was the American, excuse me, the Amusement and Music Operators Association, the AMOA, which is the big coin-op quarter-eating game show and in, in the United States. And mostly attended by game, game room operators and arcade chain executives and, and various other industry hacks. And the thing is, the tragic thing is no, none of these people actually play video games. You know, and and we had to fit out there. Nobody would play it. I mean, they were afraid. They were so afraid of this game that I had to like spend my time trying to lure people into our booth to like play the game. And um, they'd want to watch me play the game, or you know, sometimes we'd, we'd have a couple of kids in there playing the game. But mostly the game was empty because nobody, everybody was so afraid of the game. I guess it was all the buttons. You know, we just had so many buttons on there. Um, that, you know, people just go, man, I just can't deal with this. Uh, 
Um, so it's kind of like, well, we go, oh, okay, it's kind of cool, you know. Maybe we'll sell a thousand games or something. You know, maybe some suckers will buy them. Um, but at, you know, at, at the time, it seemed like it was a like it was a bomb. But I don't know. We were just so high from finishing the thing that it wasn't disappointing at all. In fact, I don't know. We kind of maybe were proud that it intimidated everyone. You know, it's like <laughs> we were kind of proud that the game like freaked people out. You know. <laughs> So it was, it was kind of, you know, people kind of, um, I thought it was kind of a bomb, you know. Um, the buzz on the show was like Pac-Man and Defender were like bombs. Um, Pac-Man because it just played forever and it wasn't exciting and Defender was like way too complicated to play. And, uh, and people were thinking this game Rally X, which was a little car racing game, was like the, the big game in the show. We stuck it out in an arcade, and um, the first night, I didn't even show up. You know, I mean, you just you, you, you stick this thing out. You've been working on this thing for months. You almost got fired, you know. I mean, there was a point where I cleaned out my desk, you know, in, certain, in like the dark days when I was working on the astronauts. So I'd actually cleaned out my desk and had put all my stuff in boxes. I mean, I was that close to, like, just quitting. And... So I was, I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to find out what people really wanted. Like, so we, I didn't show up first night. And second night, I go out to the arcade, and the place was just, there was like people 10 deep watching Defender. There was people sitting on chairs and couches and like camped out around this game. And at that point, I figured, wow, this maybe this is kind of cool. That was VidKids. That was, um, we started in February of 81, and then Stargate was our first game. And that, what else did you guys do besides Stargate? We did Stargate, Robotron, and then a game called Blaster, which is, uh, falls into that low production category. And uh, we also actually developed an Atari 800 version of that game, which preceded the coin-op, and uh, was never brought to market. Um, well, Eugene and I did, uh, we, you know, we shared the load. It was, uh, we had to d a lot to do in a pretty short period. Um, in, the, uh, in the sense of doing a sequel, um, we were in a world where the only, th there were a couple of uh, sequel games at the time. They had done Asteroids Deluxe behind Asteroids, and they took everything that was fun out of the game. And they had done Deluxe Space Invaders behind Space Invaders, which was essentially the same game. And we wanted something that would give some good new appeal to the game, but that wouldn't be playable by the good players to the extent where they were playing 10, 15, 20 minutes on Defender. If they walk up to Stargate and are playing 20 minutes a game, this game's not going to have any ability to make money. So we, um, you know, worked really hard to come up with a mechanism to make the game good for the for the better player um, without having him uh, stay there for long periods of time. Contrary to, to what a lot of people would believe, the uh, a game that you walk up to and you play 20 minutes immediately, you're not gonna you're not gonna be very interested in. You know, you, you need the new conquest. You need to to go up there and have it going. You know, you know your you know your your dog food, and uh, and 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 for you to want to come back and and try and learn and, and beat it. So in Stargate, we we put the warp feature in. Which uh, was a it was a matter of of rescuing and holding on to four humanoids and flying through the Stargate, which is a pretty high level accomplishment. But if you're a good defender player, it's it's you know you can do it in your sleep. And what that did was that gave you a huge bonus, took you ahead uh, two or three waves in the game, and uh, and and giving you the bonus gave you a couple extra ships. So it was a way to get the good players to jump into where the action was frenzied and make them think that they were having a one-up on the game, and uh, it worked pretty well. When I first got the Digital Eclipse program, I, you know, my, my mind was blown. My first encounter was actually uh, Paul DeSalt called me over to the, to the front of our building, and there's two guys there with a Macintosh, and Paul goes, I want to show you something. And 
and you know he played with his Macintosh and typed something and all of a sudden the, the carpet sweeps of the memory test which is pretty much a signature of the old Williams games um, is appearing on the Mac and I'm like oh my god you guys wrote a simulator If someone had told me in 1982 that in 1995 I'd be sitting on my computer playing on a machine that's simulating the program, my exact work, I, I mean, I would have thought, you know, I, I would have wondered what the guy was smoking. Um, the, uh, the games themselves, when they were done, were such a struggle against what could technically be done with affordable horsepower. The, 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 the fact that this could happen is, is just, uh, you know, represents amazing growth in the, in the speed and size of these computers.